That's a, that's a difficult text, and I'm going to try to preach on it. Um, and it's actually uh, that passage from uh, Matthew 25 has been endlessly dissected, uh, interpreted by commentators down through the centuries. Uh, it kind of reminds me there's a place in John's gospel, John chapter 6, where Jesus is also there engaged in some difficult teachings in front of his disciples, and he discerns that um, what he's teaching them is hard. And he says to them, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. And so the question for us is, having heard uh, that passage from Matthew 25, where is um, the spirit? Where is the life? Because after all, these are the words of Jesus himself, who is the word made flesh, and every word that flows from his mouth, as he says, is spirit and life. So... Sometimes this text is called the parable of the last judgment. It's not technically a parable, but that's often how it's referred to. And where we are, uh, to put this in context in Matthew 25, is at the very end of that chapter. And actually, there are two chapters, chapter 24 and chapter 25, where Jesus is doing his final major block of teachings. Some commentators break it out into five different sections, and this is the final part of his final teaching before we move in to the crucifixion and resurrection part of Matthew's story. And this section begins with the question of his disciples to Jesus, when will these things take place? Their question is about when will we expect the final consummation of God's plans. And Jesus, again, teaches in in parables, the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the the ten virgins and the the wedding banquet, uh, the parable of the tenants, and then this text today. When will these things take place? This being the final section of the final teaching block in Matthew's gospel, this is important, what we've just heard. What I want to do is just take a minute or two to look at the first two verses that have some, I think, important um, scriptural notes that will help us understand all the rest. And the first is, uh, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, Jesus refers to Himself with this messianic uh, title. It's actually a reference here to the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, which itself is a vision of God's coming glory. And the Son of Man, I mean, could be translated the human. In other words, when God comes as the messianic figure in human form, what will we see? We'll see his glory. We'll see the glory of God in the Son of Man. And when this happens, okay, that's, that's the setup for everything that is to follow here. And Jesus says, all nations will be gathered. Ta ethne is the Greek here. And what is in view here is not just the Jewish people, but Pagans all over the world, whatever whatever revelation they may have, imperfect as it may be, they will be they will be judged, because the Son of Man, when He comes in His glory, is not just the Son of Man for a particular religious group, but for the whole world, all nations. And then, of course, we hear the shepherd image. Interestingly, the Son of Man comes in His glory. He's going to be like a shepherd. And of course, as you know. Uh, the image of, of a shepherd for the Lord is one of the most prominent all the way through scriptures, not just, not just Psalm 23. Uh, think about the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. At the end, it is Jacob on his deathbed who says the Lord has been his shepherd all through his crazy life, every step of the way. Then we get to the very end book of Revelation and have that curious passage where the lamb is situated there in the center in his glory on the throne. And then in the next verse, he's also referred to as the shepherd. So the lamb who is Jesus is also the shepherd. And all the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, they were, David, they were all shepherds, right? Um, so we hear this shepherd imagery And it would be important if you're one of Jesus' original hearers in the first century, you would know this, but if you're a shepherd of some means, you're going to have not just sheep in your flock, you're going to probably have goats. Very, very common for sheep and goats uh, to kind of belong to a single shepherd, and during the day, they would be intermingled, the sheep and the goats. But if you're a good shepherd, you would not go to bed leaving the sheep and the goats together. Goats are notoriously uh, more rambunctious, smarter, 
more clever that is, and they will wreak havoc. They will eat anything, by the way, uh, including chewing on the sheep. And so uh, you would not leave the goats and the sheep together. You would separate them out. And by the way, separating is actually the Hebrew sense of what judgment is. Judgment in the Hebrew, the biblical sense has to do with sifting, like wheat and chaff, uh, like weeds and wheat. Jesus tells another parable about judgment and separating. Here it's the separation of the sheep and the goats. And those who are the sheep, those two will be judged well, in other words, are at the right hand of the Father. And this is another very familiar, easy to overlook image uh, of God. It has to do with the strength of God, and usually it's referred to as a place of honor. So those who are sifted out, regarded as sheep, will be brought into the presence, the glory of the Lord at His right hand. And then everything that follows about um, people who tended to and visited and helped out those who were hungry, thirsty, naked, strangers, sick, and in prison, right? And the judgment is those who did that, tended those people who were vulnerable and weak and without are judged well, and those who don't are the goats. It is an utterly conventional morality tale if we tell it like that. That is, a, that, is a, that is a story that would be told in any culture, in any religion, anywhere in the world at any time. Do good, you'll be rewarded. Don't do good, you're not going to be rewarded. So because this is Christianity and it's the gospel, we have to ask, well, what's, how, how is this not a conventional morality tale? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that morality tale. <laughs> if nothing else, do hear that, but I want you to hear more. Here's the twist. Neither the sheep nor the goats were aware that the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the stranger, the sick, and the prisoner were actually where the Lord was to be found. They did not know that it was Christ in those persons. So again, Jesus says, when I speak words, it is spirit and it's life. And I think what the Spirit is wanting to reveal to us again as we engage this text, where the life is, is to remember, to be aware that when Christ comes in His glory, the pattern is He will show up among the least of these. In other words, He will show up and domin His dominion will not look like the dominions of this world. The glory of the Lord is present with the least of these. Christ's power, as Paul says again and again, is found in weakness. Royal majesty that we celebrate this day dwells in lowly humanity. So I want to make three quick points. And the first is this. Yes, the sheep who are gathered in the presence of Jesus as Lord will find themselves being propelled outward to the neediest, to those in pain, those who suffer. But this is not the law. And if I may say so, um, I've heard a lot of Episcopal preaching over the years because I've always worked in large church settings with associates and I get to hear them preach. Occasionally I've heard this preached by Episcopal clergy as a kind of a works righteousness sermon. And, in, and sometimes it almost comes across as a gentle scolding. Well, have you, have you been feeding the hungry? You know, um, shame on us. Uh, this is not the law. No one, no one comes into the gospel through, through kind of a, a, a moral scolding. And the spirit of life is not found in justification by works. A good Protestant principle. So I need to just mention that this is not a parable. This is not a story that Jesus tells, an illustration he shares about do-goodism. There's nothing wrong with do-goodism. We need to do good, but that is actually should be a response to grace, not some kind of means to think we work our way into grace. But secondly, it's both and. Jesus is not talking here in mere abstraction or spiritualized truth. Uh, Jesus is the Word made flesh. Again, He doesn't just speak words to us. They, they are embodied in the real human condition, and they should motivate us to respond where He is moving. 
where he's present in the real human condition. One of the things that's very clear from the Gospels and one of the things that the religious authorities who encountered Jesus in the Gospels couldn't quite get their heads around is why was this person who others claimed was Christ the King hanging out with people like he was hanging out with, not the people you would expect. We should, we should learn something from that. So we are not to confuse social action for the gospel itself, but let us never think that the gospel does not lead us to social action. One of my um, spiritual and theological heroes of the church, you've heard me mention him before, is a British missionary bishop to India, and then he was a missionary back in his home country to the UK when he finished that work in the 20th century, um, is Leslie Newbegin. And there's a place where Newbegin talks about the two mutually reinforcing aspects of Christian witness. And one is Christian proclamation. Uh, always be prepared uh, to give a defense or to share the reason for the hope that is within you, 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give some testimony of why you're a believer, okay? But also, he talks about not only Christian proclamation, but Christian presence, and very often, Christians down through the centuries, and I can look in the mirror and point at myself, have focused more energy on proclaiming on a stage than actually being present. Being present where? Where Jesus already is present. And what we know about Jesus and his presence is that he is among the least of these. And so we hold those things together. It's possible to be a church that's all about Christian presence and not so great at Christian proclamation and one that's good about Christian proclamation and not Christian presence. And I find this, this, this text to be very helpful in sort of evaluating how am I doing, how are we doing, bringing those two things together. Uh, it's a famous story about um, uh, St. Martin of Tours, who was a fourth century Roman soldier before he became a Christian, and I think later a bishop. Um, our sister parish over here, St. Martin's, is named for him. And the legend is that one day on a freezing night in France, he came across a poor beggar who was asking him for alms. And because Martin didn't have any money on him, he looked at this shivering beggar and took off his cloak and, and tore it in half and gave the beggar half of his cloak and went away with his other half. And that night he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw an angel of the Lord speaking to Jesus himself who was wearing what? half of a cloak. And he told the angel, he said, when I was cold, Brother Martin handed me this cloak. I think that's just a, a, good, a good little fable for us to think about in relationship to this text. Thirdly and lastly, I want to just say that, um, yes, this is more than spiritualized truth, but I do think we can think about it spiritually also for our own lives. It does have spiritual meaning. Um, we are, each one of us, sort of a maddening crossbreed of sheep and goat. Uh, I, I am, anyway. Um, and I think we can hear it that way. That when the Lord comes in his glory, that part of me that's the goat part is going to be dealt with. Yes, it's going to be named, it's going to be called out, but it'll be separated. Because I believe in Jesus, I will be left with just the sheep part, and I will be whole, and I will be in his holy presence. The good news here is that the judge at the end of time is Jesus. <laughs> is there anybody you can imagine that you would rather be your judge, given that we will all be judged, than Jesus, who loves you so much that he died for you on the cross? And that same love that led him through the crucifixion will be the same love that looks at you and looks at me, and says, I want to separate out the goat from the sheep in you. And you are my sheep who will dwell with me forever. When I was at one of the lowest points in my life, not probably the lowest point in my life, and I knew that the goat part had uh, kind of overwhelmed the sheep part in that little chapter, the person that I most probably dreaded having to um, come clean in front of was also the person that I, I, I believe loved me the most. And that was my father. That was my father. And so when the night came when, again, I had to come clean, uh, that was very, very painful for me. 
and yet it was so freeing for me and really the beginning of a new beginning because it was precisely in that period when I came back to Christ and had my reconversion experience because the one who needed to call out the goat in me was the one who loved me more or at least as much as anybody I could think of, and that's my father. So I just use that as an analogy for us. Again, I want to close with this good news. The judge, at the final time, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, is not some angry deity that we don't know. We already know who he is. He's Jesus of Nazareth, who loved us, died for us, and rose again that we could have this assurance that the time will come when all the goat in us will be dealt with forever. In fact, it already is. And so we have nothing to fear, nothing to fear at all, even as we're led onward and outward to more and more powerful ministry, both in proclamation and presence. The one who judges us is Jesus himself. He is the one who loves us most of all. Amen.